All right, everybody, welcome to the IPJ, the podcast. I'm your host, Matthew Gonzalez, in the house and thinking about all of you today. A little warm outside. Hope you're doing okay during this COVID situation. (laughs) Don't want to talk anything about that. Honestly, everyone's talking about it. Let's talk about some other stuff that's going on in the world. There's a lot going on. So buckle in. Call in friends, family, grab the gather around the screen or the radio, however you do your podcasts, and prepare for the stories you don't hear about at all most of the time, because these stories are kind of the ones that, well, most media just doesn't have the time for, honestly. And it's not like they're trying to do it a... Uh, you know purposely or anything it's just they don't have time to cover it there's a lot going on in this world we do a lot of stuff as human beings so it takes people like us here at the investigative public journalism the podcast ipj (laughs) to help bring you the information and the stories that you're missing most because they do matter and uh one of those stories that comes to my attention uh, was a story that I've been working out of um, Mariposa, California. Some of you um, may have been following that on our website, AboveAllLaws.com. Uh, Mariposa County has had some issues with uh, cor- corruption, uh, drug running out of the Mariposa airport. Uh, going back to the 1980s, early 1980s, it was well documented uh, by an investigative journalist uh, named... Um, cherry um seymour and she'd written a book called um the last circle and you can read this online it is free um and it'll really give you some insight some real true insight to not only mariposa corruption and the 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 people that were involved back then including get this uh, a sheriff they called boss hog if y'all remember the uh um the uh, uh, Dukes of Hazard. They had the uh, old corrupt sheriff, Boss Hog. Well, that's pretty much what they had up there in real life. So, not a television show. Anyways, um, the corruption uh, going back so far, uh, back in the 1980s, touches a lot on the um, the political structure. Uh, a lot of um, political leaders in California, as well as leading all the way to Washington D.C., the um, uh, the journalist found out. Um, and a lot of high-ranking people, in, including people who are in the government today. Uh, Maxine Waters, for one, comes up. Now, this isn't Democrat or right uh, or, or Republican-leaning radio or podcast. That's not what we're here for. Um, believe you me, we'll dig into both equally um, because they're both uh, a part of the problem. Um, so, moving on, and regardless of all the politics, um, the county has um, been allowed to literally get away with murder. One of their own sheriff's deputies um, was uh, murdered by um, their own department, uh, members of their own department. Um, and we'll, again, read the book. I don't want to get into all of the uh, specifics of what happened back then, but the book is free online. The Last Circle, Terry Seymour, look it up. Um, But that all coincides to how the county has been um, emboldened now to uh, pretty much do whatever it wants. Um, And one of the victims of that, well, there's there's several, but one of the victims of that uh, is a man by the name of Jerry Cox. And his uh, property, uh, 437-acre parcel of land, I mean, that's huge, Um, was taken from him by the county and this was done after the county had alleged knowing that there was false allegations that the these allegations were completely false knowing that these allegations were were not false they um put him in jail facing multiple felony counts had to bail out after like a month i believe it was paid five hundred thousand dollar bail um and still had to fight and fight regardless of how much evidence proved uh beyond a reasonable doubt that he did not ever do this 
So they used that as a way to take his land by going there while he was in jail and, you know, um, basically coming up with 100 and something um, violations uh, of property, of, of his property, code violations, health and code violations, uh, proper name, health and safety code violations. Got to keep straight. So he... Um, he went through this process. He he um, finally got the charges dismissed. Uh, the case was thrown out because it was completely uh, fabricated by this woman, Ashley Harris. Um, I believe she's out of Palo Alto or something like that. But anyways, um, he did get a judgment against her finally that should have to pay his attorney fees. Um, <laughs> good luck on collecting that um, after she completely destroyed his life. So they took his land and they've you know, said that it had all these issues, kept him off his land, even destroyed it further. There's lots of videos online that he's posted where his animals were abused, his property was torn up. I mean, it was pretty bad. Um, and this guy's supposed to be a receiver. Who's this guy? None other than Mark Adams of California Receivership Group. Now, this man claims that he'll come into a county, he'll clean up blighted uh, property, basically property that's been uh, left to um, uh, damage and further damage and decay, uh, making it a hazard for, for the resident and the community at large. Um, and so he claims to be able to come in without any expense to the county or city and clean up this property. Basically, what he does is he and allegedly city attorneys and judges throughout California conspire um, working with health and safety code officers to locate properties that have some type of blight and then start issuing code violations. Now, the properties they seem to target are properties that are already paid for land that is you know homes that are paid for or almost paid for so when they go in and let's say that your 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 uh, grass is brown and uh they say they get a a, a call that because uh, other neighbors they don't like your grass being brown so the code enforcement officer comes out he'll leave a note on your door saying uh you know there's a notice you need to get this fixed within uh so much time um i would see it as a joke like really um you know who's this gonna tell me i'm paying my taxes as city code um and some do some let it go and let it go and then it festers and it actually turns into a legal case now once that legal case goes is filed that seems to be where um contacts are made for receivership and for the city attorney um uh, for all these little um, people to get involved i say little they're actually a larger part of the political structure but they get involved and if the property again is either almost paid for or completely paid off if you just started owning it they're not going to mess with you that you've got nothing for them if they were to take your land they would have to pay the bank for your land so they don't want to touch those properties so they go after the ones that don't have any remaining um, mortgages or money owed so it turns out Jerry was one of these folks and his property was pretty much paid for. Well, it was. It was paid for. Several cabins, some he had built. They claimed that there was a public code violations, but he did get um, um, uh, the permits to build these um, and he did go through the legal process. What seems to have happened is that somebody got angered at him because they're they were growing some illegal, uh, you know, grows marijuana up there like they've been doing since we were, t I mentioned earlier, since the 1980s. Um, and apparently the one that was growing it is a local prostitute and, and uh, some people that she's involved in apparently with a local cartel, as uh, Mr. Cox describes it uh, in his interview. Um, and so the uh, they've apparently you know started this ruckus with him and uh, things led to um, him being uh, targeted by the city or the county by then the city or whatever uh, by then um, coming by and looking for code violations. Now when this Ashley Harris incident happened, um, that's when things got bad. 
And I refer you to the video um, that you're going to watch now. And uh, I've cut out just the um, best choice pieces of the interview to help describe the information uh, or the situation better to you. Um, but the full length video is over an hour and that's also posted online, which you're more than welcome to go view. Um, and you can see the, uh, the link down below in this, uh, in, in the comments, uh, or information description on this podcast video cast. Okay. Moving on. So Mark Angelucci, um, was assassinated on July 11th, 2020 at approximately 4 PM in the evening. Um, at his home in Crestview, California. Uh, Crestview, California, I went there. At, it's very uh, much secluded. It's up in the mountains, a lot of, you know, windy roads, um, beautiful area, uh, beautiful trees. Um, Lake uh, Gregory, I believe it was, is up there. Um, had a great time, uh, just, just because of the scenic back, uh, backdrop. But... Um, it, it was very surreal going to um, uh, Mark's home. Um, I never got to meet Mark personally, and uh, it's one of the regrets I have of this life. Um, he seemed like a man who um, was on my same page as far as helping people that don't have a voice uh, to have a voice. Um, and I really would have liked to have met him. So Mark um, has been accused in the media, they're basically writing his story, um, that he's a, um, a feminist uh, lawyer, you know, one of those kind of lawyers, you know, full of, full of woman hate and hate towards women. Um, but Mark apparently was further from the truth. I can't speak to others, but I can only speak about Mark. He's the one that I've been dealing with. Um, I do have some recorded interviews w of him that I'm, I'm kind of debating whether or not I want to um, release, you know, yet. Because it's still, it's hard to hear a dead man's voice, right? Um, I'm not, a, not an animal. Um, I respect all life. And so, I mean, even an animal would respect that, right? So anyways... Um, Mark uh, was involved in, in helping not only um, Jerry Cox in his case, he jumped in there a full swing and saw the corruption firsthand and, and started getting um, Jerry movement on his case. And in fact, he had gotten a federal court case um, uh, going an appeal uh, on the state case out of Mariposa, which they're in the process of now. They've already sold his land for 700000 when in fact his land is over $2 million dollars. They sold it to somebody for seven hundred thousand. They got their money, um, and basically they're hoping to divvy it up. Uh, we're hoping to divvy it up, um, but apparently that might be on hold now, especially since Mark's assassination. And um, the federal case may actually um, void out the state case because of the complete illegality. 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 How, how do you? <laughs> Anyways, that. Uh, of the entire case it's just not legal to take a man's land in in america um especially giving him only 30 days to fix over 100 supposed um health health and safety code violations um absolutely ridiculous so anyways a, a federal judge has already ruled and had ruled before mark's death and and that's the last time that i'd spoke spoken to mark uh, in depth about the case um he was really excited about that um happy that the judge was seeing the federal judge was seeing the complete um, um i don't want to say illegality again because the judge you know uh, the federal judge I, I don't know his exact um thinking but he has seen some discrepancies in the case that would possibly lead to the state case being voided. And then the county of Mariposa owing um, Mr. Cox uh, millions uh, upon millions of dollars uh, in damages. Absolutely. Um, so this brings me to Mark Angelucci and his assassination. Um, let me back up. This brings me now to uh, Mark and what I was talking about, his background 
uh, of not being an anti-feminist attorney. I have a, a second interview uh, from a woman who came forward, forward named Jennifer Johnson. Um, she's out of the uh, Central Valley. Um, she, well, not actually out of the Central Valley. She's, um, I don't really want to tell you where she's at. She's somewhere out there. Um, but she had her kids, um, she turned over her kids to a, a, a grandparent, um, the uh, mother of her husband, who turns out is uh, alleged to be a, a um, uh, physical abuser and apparently was um, convicted in court of it, of brutally beating the mother um, and told to stay away from his kids. She has apparently um, been through the ringer with the same judge, Judge Dana Walton, who's seeing Jerry Cox's case and has manipulated that whole case. He is being he has been seeing her case, overseeing her case as far as a guardianship, not a custody, but a guardianship case. You see, Jennifer had some issues uh, in life, and she thought it wise to allow her grandmother to, or the children's grandmother, her mother-in-law, to take uh, custody of the children until she could get her life straightened out. Um, she since did that. Um, she got also got rid of the um, her mother-in-law's son as her husband she divorced him and the mother or the grandmother still has the kids in guardianship she's tried to get her kids back the grandmother has petitioned the court the court dana walton knows the mother the grandmother the kids he's go to church with them and everything so the conflicts are crazy yet he still sees the case he forces the mother to take not one but i believe it's four follicle hair follicle tests um, one she, the first one she flunked. She admitted that. The, the other three or two, three, something like that, she, she passed. Um, but there was one follicle test, uh, the last one that um, she was supposed to take, that a woman came forward saying she took the test. Though Jennifer claimed she never met that woman. The woman came to court one time, the first time, said that she would come back and testify as the judge, Dana Walton, asked her to. And she's not been seen since. Um, the judge has issued a bench warrant for her. No one's seen or heard from this woman. This is a woman that the grandmother brought forward. So it looks like the grandmother basically manipulated uh, the case to look like um, um, Jennifer was had a dirty drug test and um, or was going to test dirty, I should say. And the other woman gave a hair follicle test who didn't have drugs in her system. Anyways, the story is long. It's not as long as Jerry's. It's about 30-something minutes long. Um, but it's worth giving a listen to and look at. We're going to do some uh, quick details on that one as well. Now, the reason why I bring this up about Jennifer's case is because Mark Angelucci, you know, saw her post on Facebook. She'll talk more about it in the video. Uh, and he jumped right into it. And he realized that if he could get into court and win her case, he had a greater chance of winning um uh, jerry cox's case overall as well showing that judge dana walton is as corrupt as he is so she um she has since still not had she still has not gotten her kids back she started working with mark on this just before mark was assassinated and he had really gotten some progress for her um, and he started getting some things rolling for her um, and it was looking really good again and she had hope and you know everything was going well and then you know he he would talk with her always in a positive way he would always tell her that um, it's all about justice it's it's not about um, a man or a woman or, or anything like that it's about the justice so people need to rewrite his story you know go interview don't just sit at your desk at cnn msnbc fox news and all these other uh, corporate media outlets that have tons of people sitting behind desks tapping out freaking um phases uh, or phrases uh, and, and sound bites they hear from from google do what i did grab a camera Go to San Bernardino County or wherever the story takes you and get the news. That's why a lot of people have problems with corporate media. 
They just don't get out and talk to the people and gather the news. What they do is they take the uh, information that they have on Google, put together a story. They will talk to their um, law enforcement uh, contacts because they keep those relationships. Regardless if law enforcement lies to them, blatantly lies to them, these corporate medias will spread this because they know they need to keep those relationships. That's why indivis- in independent investigative public journalists like myself people who are not associated with any major outlets and they keep things you know straight no political bias no personal bias none of that other stuff just report what it is because on its own it's enough and we need to make positive change by sharing these stories so now that I've filled a bunch of uh, information out there and thrown a bunch at you, let's get to these videos. There's going to be uh, short um, uh, videos from um, um, Jerry Cox and his interview. And then we're going to cut over to, uh, we'll, we'll do a brief on that uh, overview. And then we'll cut over to Jennifer's. And then after that, um, we're going to cut into some, a uh, um, little bit about Jennifer's. And, and then um, and we'll end it up uh, with some some solutions because it's all about finding solutions all right here we go start us off where it all began you had a ranch that you'd purchased uh, 40 437 acres was it um in mariposa county yeah i mean if you uh get good grades, go to school, go to college, find a good job, work your ass off, you can buy a ranch. And so did I. I mean, I was like 32 years old when I bought it. I thought I was old at the time. Like, oh, you know, you're 32 years old. You've been working for like 15 years. I've been working since I was 13. So working 17 years already. And I bought a ranch and, uh, and, uh, uh, I got on the farmers only because someone kept telling me you need to get on farmers only. So I got onto Farmers Only and uh, and uh, met this gal, and um, she uh, kept uh, getting worse and worse as I got to know her. Like she started to, you know, tell people she'd been raped before by other people, and then I've had other people come up to me and say, "Hey, I, I went to the bathroom with this girl. I've only met her ten minutes. My buddy's girlfriend, and she's saying she got raped by some guys in a van or in a van or at, at Cal Poly." And I'm like, "I don't know." So. I ended up uh, leaving that last week. I was gone for three or four days to see if she'd take a hint and maybe leave. But I came back. She's still there hanging out with my friends. And uh, uh, I just asked her to leave. That was it. But she sent the text messages uh, that were very open and, and sexually explicit. Yeah, the picture she sent, uh, that was after we've already had sex, uh, when she was bending over saying she was horny. That was She was in Pismo Beach at the time or something like that. Was that an actual picture of her body? Yeah. Yeah, she sent it to me. She put everything on there. You know, I'm horny. And I was actually shocked when I got it. I was like, whoa. And I looked at the picture. I'm like, well, that's kind of hot. You know, I thought that, but I mean, but it's, I mean, I... She, I mean, she sent the picture. I didn't ask her to. And when did you find out that there was a complaint made against you? I, I we didn't know anything. I mean, we we uh, I worked all day, uh, uh, and then we went into town. I took my buddies out for hamburgers, Aaron and Amando, and uh, I, I think I had one or two beers at the most. So I don't really drink that much, and uh, especially beer, and. Uh, we were coming home and there was a sheriff up there by the airport just sitting there at first i thought he was just sitting there watching people go back and forth but then he started following us and then when he started following us he uh pulled us over and then when he pulled us over there was another one behind him with a dog and uh there was jerry cox in the car they're telling my buddy he was driving because i had a beer or two and uh they go yeah and i get out thinking like they want to talk to me about maybe my livestock or, you know, buffalo or something stupid. And then they, they arrested me for, like, all this crap, and I didn't even listen to it all. It was like, well, you're getting arrested for, for rape, and I think they threw kidnapping and sodomy or blah, 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 da-da-da-da-da-da. I'm like, oh, you know. 
they, they pretty much have control of you at that point. They just handcuff you, take you in. Uh, no, they're, they're putting the shaft to me, man. I was locked up with the other four other sex offenders. And when it, when it first came to me that I wasn't probably going to get out was uh, when I was sitting there one of the first times in front of the judge. And they had, you know, the chains on my hands, chains on my legs, everything. It was almost Thanksgiving, I think. And uh, uh, they were showing pictures of her, right? You know, like, you know, Your Honor, here, look, look at this picture. And uh, I was just kind of just kind of hanging out, wondering who was all in the audience that was there for me. Like, I saw some friends and stuff. And then I looked over at the picture, and she, it, she was showing pictures of her being beat up or bruised or something. And then I thought, oh, shit. You know, this is kind of just a, a white comes over your body and you're like i did that no i did that i mean I, then you think well i don't know if i'm ever going to get out of here <laughs> you know this is this is this is ra crazy you know and, and, and anybody can actually self-inflict or put a makeup on for a bruise and that's what i found out is she put the 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 lady that took her to do the, re do the report said she was at the airport in she had a bruise on this side and then when she went to the bathroom, she came back. The bruise is now on that side. She switched it because, you know, what is he, a right-hander or a left-hander, you know? When, were, when did you get out of, of jail? Uh, and how did you get out of jail? Was I paid bail. I paid bail. Yeah. And they weren't going to let me out. It was like a whole month I was in there. After you paid, yeah. paid bail, you were yeah. still held for 30 days. Why? I don't know. Did you ever find out? Did an attorney ever inquire? Or anything? Did you have a public defender? Uh, yeah, yeah. Who was that public defender's name? Do you remember? Uh, he was a good public defender. He didn't buy the story from day one. His name's uh, Eugene Action. He's a Harvard Law dude. He's probably the best guy they got there. He knows I'm completely innocent. He even told me back then, he goes, I heard if you sell your property, they're going to leave you alone. Like, what do you mean sell my property? Yeah, if you sell your property and move out of this county, uh they won't come after you. He said something like that one day. I'm like, what? Sell my property, move out of the county, and they won't come after me. He thought the case would be totally dismissed, you know, like when they found her out having drinks on a Thursday night when she said she's locked up for three days. Why didn't you get it done when you had that 30-day time to get those repairs that they complained about done? Well, there was 101 of them, and almost 70% uh, of them weren't even in existence. You know, like I have to tear out a state bridge and they're giving me over Christmas vacation. And then not only that, I'm fighting a freaking 15 felony fake rape case that's depleting all my funds. And to do all the stuff they want me to do, I have to pay money. I have to go and get permits. I have to get paperwork done. And I did on some of those. I went down and I paid for like to get the barn demo because I knew the barn was the only real thing that didn't have a permit. And uh, they denied me. They sent the check back. So are you still um, um, charged un uh, after all that incident with that lady um, who accused you of what's happened in that case? Uh, she was caught lying. She tried to file a restraining order when uh, the case got dropped to Mariposa. A new judge at a new court, Aaron Childs in San Luis Obispo, saw through her lies right away. And when was this, by the way? I think it was last year. Okay. And... Uh, and now she has to pay my attorney fees, but I, I haven't gotten any money from her. She's still walking the street. She's still running around. Can you tell us a little bit more about who uh, Mark Adams is and, and how what happened with your property, security-wise? Yeah, Mark Adams is uh, a California receiver appointed by the court. He's a, the biggest scam artist, lion lawyer I've ever seen in my life. Comes out there, says all the animals are starving and thirsty. He's got a picture of him spraying them down with a water hose. My animals been out there for years, and there's a year-round creek, ponds. It's all lies. Uh, <laughs> he's got a picture of my buddy's dog looking through a cage up at him. But my buddy's dog is a therapy dog, and he just went into town to get lunch and came back. My buddy that owned that dog. Anyhow, he put guards on the property, <laughs> and uh, they were armed. They were feeding the horses moldy hay. They didn't know how to lock the gates right. The animals were getting out. Uh, they had kids out there on my Honda. I, and it was my Honda. I, I don't even own the Honda. I don't even know where. All I know is I, all my credit got ruined. Nothing got paid. I didn't make any payments on the Honda because other people were driving it around. 
with kids. And, uh, uh, yeah, they watched my Netflix. They ran up my PG&E. They didn't pay any bills. They all went into collections. Um, and uh, the guards uh, left all the valves on when they left the house. So when I finally came back to the ranch after I paid like the $8,000 to fix the minor repairs on the whole 500 acres, uh, when I came back to the ranch, had the power turned on, the house is flooded because when I got there, every sprinkler valve, every kitchen valve, shower valve, washer dryer valve, they're all turned on. Nice day for a Labor Day weekend. You guys must be pretty bored out here. Huh? A video. Yeah, we're. That's a video. Yeah, you guys got kids out here? You guys have kids out here? You have kids out here. Kids out here. What's that? Yeah, I got I got two kids out here today. Oh, how old are they? I'm pretty sure there shouldn't be kids out here. Huh. I don't know what you said, but it doesn't matter. You'll see it on TV. Property to be having kids out here. No, the guards have kids out here on the ranch. I'm not allowed to come in. They're armed. They just drove off with a Honda with the kids. Yeah, exactly what they did. we got to get a video of these guys on my Honda. I'm down to Lake Stoke up at Here we are on the 21st of uh, November here. Got a chance to get back up to the ranch, move the horses, but the guards are feeding them moldy hay. They didn't cover it during the rain and the mold coming out everywhere. 18th of October and the receivers just trash the crap out of my shop I never seen so much garbage and crap <laughs> they got water running down right here and they're letting the animals drink this filthy water what the hell my gates are all tossed down broken look at that everywhere you look I don't know if they let the horses in here or what the hell they did. It's all busted up. 2019, February the 21st. I'm out here on the ranch. First time in some time. And the guards never paid for their electric. Uh, the receiver old $737. I went down and got some financial assistance today and they turn the power back on but to our dismay uh, all the valves were turned on they left every single faucet on including the shower and the faucet upstairs where the washer was that the guards were using so we're letting it dry out I'm gonna come in here and mop it out other than that, nothing else was done to this cabin. This is a total scam. The receiver wants $600,000, and all he did was remove the ladder. And there's no propane because they were in here with their kids. Out here is the bed where my dog Errol used to play. And there's no more buffalo. My horse is here. He's got a battle wound. I wonder what happened. What happened, bud? They haven't been feeding you? You look awfully thin. These guards don't know what they're doing. Look at your face. It's full of tarweed. Looks like a hell of a gash you got on your shoulder. This is October the 17th. I'm moving my horses to the Moser side since the receiver is getting paid $300,000 and he can't do the work himself. And there's the buggy that I got to pay for since they can't use my Honda. And uh, so I, I cleaned all that up. The refrigerator was moldy. Everything. I mean, these guys are health and safety experts, man. There's mice everywhere. Do you think any of this might have been done intentionally to uh, inflict more damage to the property? I just think Mark Adams doesn't care about rehabilitating. I think he's got a plan. He's going to 
try to act like he needs three hundred thousand dollars, and then he takes it out of the estate. And then by then you're over leveraged, and then he just keeps piling it on, keeps piling, and then he wants to make a seven hundred thousand dollar nut every time he sells something. They basically took everything you had, put you on the streets um, over a bogus rape allegation. Did you, where did you get an attorney yet? By this time? Yeah, the National Coalition for Men stepped in. Uh, About when did they step in? I called them up. Uh, after the all the charges were dropped, I'm like, oh, the charges are dropped, right? But then they stole my ranch. Like they, that, they, what it is is they stole the ranch, and then they dropped the charges like a month later. And uh, then I called the National Coalition for Men, and I talked to uh, the president Harry, and he referred me to Imran, and uh, and then from Imran, who is an excellent, excellent attorney by the way, he's also a victim of of abuse false accusations he lost his bar license because of you know false accusations and uh, Mark Angelucci stepped in and very incredible lawyers I mean the National Coalition for Men isn't about just men's rights it's just about being fair what about him personally did you have a personal relationship besides a business relationship was he would you consider him a friend yeah yeah i mean he was a cool friend he was like if you had a friend that was a cool dude you know like the dude takes off go to hawaii goes surfing comes back works on your case dude goes to vegas with his roommates parties a little bit comes back works on your case he was that kind of guy your case recently just this year uh was supposed to or was supposed to go for its final uh to because you they had sold the property yeah right? yeah and yeah the property um is or the money is now supposed to be divvied up yeah i got under i was very fortunate last year i was selling some things and an appraiser came by meredith the best appraiser in the county she appraises the ranch at two point like one eight million you know the first part is like 800000 and then you add the other equal amount of land plus another structure of the same magnitude plus another 120 acres. It ended up being about $2.18 million. Well, they sold it for the whole ranch for 700000 because that's just the money they want. They figured that's, that's you know... That's the that's what they that's what that's that's the minimum nut that they want to collect. It's, it has nothing to do with health and safety codes. I want to go to June 11, 2020. Um, you uh, what happened that day? Did you have plans to meet with Mark at all? What, what happened that day for you? Oh, Mark emailed me. He says, "Hey, I have to get some things signed." So I get them printed out. I look at them. I sign them. And our internet's down for a little bit, and then we send it back when our internet's on. And we were messaging Mark throughout the day. And uh, the last message he got was probably five minutes from us before he got shot. You know, I don't know if the suspect had a, a way to figure out what tower your cell phone's pinging off of, but we were sending messages. And what's interesting is up here in Crestline, is more or less a mountain home for Mark, and he's not really around that much up here. So it's really interesting that he was shot up here in the mountains when I think he could have been much easier shot and caught down there in Eagle Rock where he spends most of his time. So <clears throat> take me to that, that moment that you, you now your, your information is secondhand, but it, right. it's secondhand, but it's directly from the source. Um, Take me through that, that, what that person described to you that, that day, that when, that when that person came. Oh, you mean the eyewitness? Yeah. Okay. Um, Mark's roommates are, are, you know, they're like friends of mine. They call me, invite me over, you know, since he's been gone tw twice, I've been over there. When I was over there, I was, I was talking to uh, uh, the roommate, I'll leave his name out, the roommate's father. And the roommate, I was talking to him too. And there's other people in the room too, other people. And uh, they're all, you know, associates of Mark, friends of Mark or whatever. And uh, uh, the eyewitness says he uh, heard a knock on the door. Uh, he opened the door. There was a guy standing there with, like, brown khakis and a white shirt with a white ball cap with glasses on. Didn't have a mask. Said he was 
40. That's what he says. We say, well, how about a young 50? You go, well, you know, how about a Mark Angelucci 50? Did he possibly could have been that young? Possibly. But he said that guy said Mark Angelucci, and the older man who's probably in his 70s or 80s said, uh, no. And then the guy, and then the old man says, I'll sign though, the package. And the, the guy with the package says, no, I need Mark. So they left the door ajar. It isn't like the shooting over there in uh, New York or whatever. The door was left ajar, and there's people in the house. But they go get Mark upstairs, and when Mark came downstairs, the witness said that he heard Mark say, uh, he, he, he heard Mark walk to the door, and the guy goes, Mark Angelucci, and Mark goes, yeah. And then it was boom, 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 boom. That was it. So when the eyewitness ran into the house, because he was in the patio, he ran into the house, he saw what was going on, Mark was already out, he said. He was, he was like, he was dead. But he, he was running to the front door. He pushes the, sh the front door shut. Then he looks through the blinds. And, well, no, wait, no, let me get this straight. He pushes the front door shut. He runs back and locks the patio door. So both of the doors in the house are locked. And then he looks through the blinds. And the dude was just walking to his car. Which is interesting because you'd probably want to run. And maybe the dude was on cancer. Maybe it was that guy, Roy. But he was skinny, real skinny, which means, you know, it could be a tweaker. It could be a guy on, with stomach cancer. But he walked to the car. He hopped in the car. It was a white van. He got three letters off the license plate. He said the guy just did a three-point turn. He wasn't even, like, speeding. He just did a three-point turn and left. He must have knew that there was a dead end way down there because Mark's Road's a dead end if you keep going. And there's got to be cameras showing footage because... There's one at the Mormon church, and then if you go further down the road, there's two of them right there at the real estate office. So, so um, once, uh, well, how did you find out this had happened? Uh, I didn't find out until the next day. I mean, Mike Shikoski called me. He says, hey, there's been some phone calls about Mark being shot. I go, what? Yeah, about Mark being shot. And... I think maybe 20 or 30 minutes went by, and then I text Mike, I go, I'm gonna go take a look, I'll go over to his house. And so I went over to his house, and then when I went over to his house, nobody was there at the time. But I saw a neighbor, and I said to the neighbor, did you hear any gunshots or anything the other day? And he goes, yeah. He goes, I heard boom, 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 boom. And I think he might've been the guy that called the police originally. And, uh, and, and, and you know, they all think it might've been a drug deal or something, but. I questioned everybody. I talked to you over there at the house, all the roommates. I said, was Mark on drugs? No. Okay. He was a professional lawyer. He wasn't on drugs. Um, did he get a, anybody jealous? Did he, did he go to the bar, meet some chick, you know, or boyfriend got jealous or down in Mexico or anything like that? No. Did he talk about everything with you? Yeah, he talked about everything. You know, like if he met a girl somewhere, he would talk about it. Okay, so who do you think did this? Who do you think did this? And they go, we think it was Mark Adams, and we think it was Mariposa County. And this is coming from everybody in the house. And in my mind, I thought maybe it could be something else. But then after questioning them, I'm thinking it is Mark Adams. It is Mariposa County. And then come to find out, it might be this Roy guy, you know, or it's a cover-up. But, but what would be the motive? You know, they're on the same side. They're fighting the same cause. What would really be the motive to go kill a guy? I don't know. Okay, so let's be clear. We don't know for sure that Mark Adams um, or anyone else at this moment is a suspect in the uh, assassination of Mark Angelucci. From what we understand, law enforcement is pushing the um, assassination onto uh, Den Hollander. But there's just a lot of missing information. Like he apparently uh, allegedly arrived in Los Angeles uh, on the uh, or arrived in San Bernardino train station uh, on June the seventh, uh, I believe it was, um, is what we have. Um, and then four days he spent doing what before June or July the eleventh. So from July the 7th to July the 11th, what was he doing? We don't know. You don't come to some place to seek out your, your prey, especially if you're going directly to that train station. He went to San Bernardino train station and Mark is just moments away. 
what the FBI is saying that is that he rented a vehicle and he went to, um, uh, well, he rented a vehicle and he went somewhere. They don't know exactly where, which doesn't make a bit of sense. Um, if they can get the rental vehicle, they can check the mileage. Um, there might be GPS navigation on that vehicle. Um, not to mention his cell phone records. Uh, if his cell phone was on, they can ping that thing and know exactly where he was and what he's been up to. Um, so it doesn't take much. It just takes the effort by law enforcement to get the, uh, get the information and then to get it out to the public uh, so that we can look at it, scrutinize it, and realize that, yes, Mr. Den Hollander did this. But at the moment, I'm personally only at like 75% that he did do this. I need some serious evidence. So, and the public needs some serious evidence. We all do. Um, most of all, Mark uh, Angelucci's family. Um, and I don't want to bring this, them into this at all. I'm sure that they want to let this be and allow law enforcement to do what they need to do. And they probably don't need me running my mouth about it. But <sighs> that's what I do. <laughs> Anyways, um, so another thing is law enforcement um, sources have been involved uh, in this case for a number of years. The Jerry Cox case, they pointed out that uh, Mr. Cox's um, attorney, Mark Angelucci, uh, did file a federal lawsuit um, uh, for several violations uh, against uh, Mr. Mark Adams um, and CRG, uh, including um, allegation, uh, an allegation of a violation of RICO statutes. Um, and this seems to be exactly what is going on. Excuse me, I can't even speak right. This seems to be exactly what is going on um, up there with Mr. Adams uh, and his um, receivership business. This receivership business, he basically started as the housing market or housing crisis started crumbling back in 2007, 2008. He kind of came out with this little idea, I guess, and re realized that, a receiver is basically anybody. Anybody can be uh, be appointed by a court, by a judge, as a receiver of a of a piece of land, of a building, of a parcel. The only reason why a judge would step in to appoint a receiver would be so that you, the owner of that property, can bring your property back up to code, so it's not a danger to you and your neighbors. It's not supposed to have been designed as a mechanism or a tool to take property from somebody after they've invested their life into it and then sell it for, their, for, for another company's profit or gain. Uh, so Mr. Mark Adams, as an attorney, most attorneys do, they find loopholes in the law and then they um, completely exploit them. And that's what Mr. Adams is doing. So he's a, a completely exploiting this conservatorship law. Now, no, receivership law, excuse me. Now, there's other attorneys and judges who've caught on to this and go, wow, you know, there's a few hundred thousand here, a few hundred thousand there just waiting for me to gobble up. And all I have to do is appoint this receivership. And so that's what they do. Now, the judges and themselves, they don't receive this money. But the, um, the cities uh get paid back for any expenses um and then the attorney's fees the attorneys make a ton of money on this and everybody walks away with a little coin in their pocket the homeowner walks away without any home it's it doesn't make a bit of sense there's um there's several cases there's another one out in newport beach um where a 78 year old um woman uh, was forced to stay in a hotel while repairs were allegedly being done on her home. However, the water at her home had been shut off, um, which then caused the lawn to die and weeds to sprout up in their place. The, and the lawn and weed issue triggered the response by the city of Newport Beach code enforcement personnel. Okay. So she's having repairs done on her home. A 78-year-old woman... And because she had the water turned off because the um, water pipe is being repaired and her grass cannot be watered, they've literally taken her home practically. I mean, 
She's living in her garage, forced to live in the garage while these people supposedly br- uh, fix the issue. They've fixed the issue, but now they've wanted to demo this. They want to demo that, remodel this, remodel that, because they keep saying, oh, well, there's there's termites, or there wasn't termites. We thought there was. That, that was their excuse. And they completely removed all of her kitchen and walls, and uh, it's disgusting. The stuff she had, uh, she had built um, custom for her size and everything because of, of, of issues she had during an accident. Mark Adams goes into these properties, looking at them as a way to either completely um, remodel them uh, or demo them and rebuild. Then he charges the homeowner for this. And it's way more than what the homeowner can ever afford to pay. The repairs could be $1,000. In the end, you're going to owe $700,000 or more. This has to stop. Mark Angelucci was involved in stopping this. Um, And by the way, that's not the only two victims. There's several, several victims out there in California who are literally homeless because of Mark Adams and people like him. Uh, There's law firms that I need to point out that I, I just... Anyways, I'll get too crazy into it. Let's let's move on. I don't want to get too far into the discussion because we got more to talk about uh, from uh, on the other side of this next video. Um, this next video is a young lady, uh, like I said, um, young woman, not young lady, young woman, um, who uh, divorced the man um, who uh, she had these children with, um, and she put into guardianship with his mother. I, I mentioned earlier that she was married to him. My apologies. She is not married to the fool. Um, she has since gotten smart. I probably shouldn't call him a fool because of his children. Um, so he's not a fool. He's just made some very bad mistakes. And by the way, we all make mistakes. We just have to learn from them and learn to move forward in a positive way. If you continue to make mistakes, then you're an idiot. Don't keep making mistakes, all right? So moving on, um, let's watch this video. Jennifer Johnson, uh, I shot this uh, just after the Jerry uh, Cox interview, um, and it's very compelling, especially um, the information about her case and then the description about Mark Angelucci and how he's not this Haiti hating you know feminist and you know lawyer out there looking to um attack a woman and take her into court because she's a woman you know what our women (laughs) i want to be straight up with this our women bleed every damn month for a week show me one man that can bleed for a week and not die think about that let's watch this movie meet with us today um, and it's uh, it's a tragedy that's what's happened but I want to welcome you and thank you for being able to be here to, to talk about it. Definitely thank you so much Matthew for letting me talk about Mark I mean it's ba- barely maybe taking the edge off a little bit um, just to be able to talk about him for sure. Got it. Now before Mark stepped into the picture your case sprouted roots. It has to do with your ex-husband, your mm-hmm. mother-in-law? My ex-mother-in-law, yes. Your ex-mother-in-law, mm-hmm. and the guardianship of your children. Right. Can we just kind of pick up right there? You were in some, eh, going through some life issues, and you decided the right thing to do at that moment was to allow someone who could help with the children at that moment help, and you got yourself back up and running in. Right. Let's just kind of give a little summary of that. Um, well, my this is about my two youngest children because I have um, four older biological and two older adopted. Um, so they're ages nine and six. Um, I was, like you said, having uh, some troubles, and my I've always been a big proponent of grandparents helping to raise kids, um, and my ex mother in law at the time offered to take the boys and um, we were in Vegas she brought them back to Mariposa to take care of them for a temporary time until I could get on my feet again Um, while she was 
what, after she brought them back to Mariposa, she applied or, or petitioned and was granted guardianship of them. How long after that you brought the children there did she file the guardianship? Uh, so around the middle of 2016 is when um, gar the original guardianship was first granted. And um, uh, let's see, I petitioned to terminate that, that guardianship at the end of 17, almost closer to 18, but at the end of 17. That was a long and messy case. Uh, I believe it was almost two years in court um, of me having to jump through all kinds of hoops um, get a place for the boys to be. I wasn't allowed to have a significant other. I wasn't allowed to um, take the boys around anybody that wasn't approved by her. And, um, and then part of that was to do a hair follicle, a drug test, um, because she was thinking that I was still on drugs. It's really, really hard to get your kids back out of guardianship. Um, it's not in family court. They don't, they're not, that, that court, it's in probate court, basically. And that court's not backed by child psychologists and, um, and mediators and um, counselors, people that know, that know how to deal with these kind of cases and, and that know what the laws are. So why would they have you take a drug test? I don't understand. Um, well, I, I believe that um, the judge, my case, Judge Walton, that he was... Um, I, I just, I really feel, feel like this is how he operates all the time. He, he just, he found a way to order me to do a drug test, which was against the law without ordering me to do it. The hair follicle sample that you took from Judge Walton this time came back dirty? The very first one, yes. So was there a second one? There were three more. So this, the second test, we went back to court, the test was clean. He said he wanted to see me have another clean hair follicle test, so he was going to give it another 90 days. So um, he had said in court that he wanted to see me and the kid's dad getting along so that we wouldn't be fighting in family court. So, um, so even after he um, made me jump through more and more hoops and she was still accusing me of doing drugs, um, Who was it you? My, my ex-mother-in-law. Right. Um, the uh, hair follicle was supposed to be taken, a yes. sample. This we did this. the third one. So we, the second one was clean. Right. The third one was clean. Right. Then he wanted one more. And the, during the last part of the, the, the case, the last part of the whole process, um, in the middle of that whole thing, that whole process, uh, my ex-husband and I got back together and um, we, we had a really, really bad, um, I don't know how to say that situation. He went to jail and was convicted of domestic violence against me. Um, Judge Walton told me he wanted one more hair follicle test because he wanted, he, because he he doubted my judge, judgment abilities by letting the kid's dad back in my life. So, um, so in any case, the fourth one, the fourth test was also clean. And Judge Walton said, I, I had done everything that I was supposed to do and he was terminating the guardian, guardianship. Um, the tricky part at the time is that now we had a, a criminal protective order where I wasn't, didn't have any contact with the kid's dad. Um, and he, of course, wanted visitation with them still. And so he actually filed for visitation in family court. We went to family court. The family court um, commissioner, um, Judge Pimentel, ruled that he could only have supervised visitation at his own expense and um and i mean judge walton even made it clear in, in court that the laws were definitely on my side protecting me at that point because if you're convicted against if you're convicted of domestic violence against the other parent you have all all visitation all custody taken away 
is cut and dry. Um, which was appropriate at the time, especially considering what just had happened. Um, so basically as soon as Judge Pimentel said that my ex could only have supervised visitation, probably within a couple of weeks, uh, I went to go pick up my son at school, and, or I was on the way to pick up my son at school, and my daughter called me, who went to the same school. She said, Keenan's in the office and they won't let him leave. That's my son, my little, my nine-year-old. I said, what do you mean they won't let him leave? She said, I don't know. They're not telling me anything. And um, I went to the school and was served with papers saying that ex parte orders had already been granted, that she had the guardianship back. Um, my, um, in the end, the only thing that I was, t that the only reason the kids were taken from me again was because um, someone accused me of hiring them to take my hair follicle tests for me. Um, the person that accused me of that came, came to the court, one of the court hearings one time um, and was in the back of the courtroom. And at the end of the hearing, Judge Walton said, you're the person who this is about, whatever, you're the person who supposedly took the test. And she said, yes. And he said, I'm gonna need you to come back to court and testify. She said, no problem, I'll be there. He gave her the date. Um, he issued a subpoena. Um, she never came back. What is this one thing? Marcy. Villa El Pondo. And is she from the Mariposa area? I have no idea. So she's not a friend of yours? She's nope. She's somebody you were in cahoots with? And I never saw her before. She claims that I, that I put a Craigslist ad up. Marcy Villa El Pondo, the supposed imposter that took my hair follicle, never came back to court. Judge Walton issued um, two subpoenas, a bench warrant, um, an actual warrant. Uh, I looked up, I did a background check on her and found her being held in contempt of court in Fresno on another case. Um, so Judge Walton in the end ruled that um, it was completely evident that I had hired someone to take my hair follicle tests and that I had defrauded the courts and that those were the grounds for putting my children into permanent guardianship with my ex-mother-in-law. Before we go any further, let me just um, clarify um, Judge Walt Walton's relationship to you and mm. your family. There's, there's actually um, a conflict of interest because he's, he knows your family very well. Am I, right, am I wrong? right. He, Can um, you touch on that a little bit? Sure. He, um, he and his wife and his daughter, uh, both his daughters, go to the same church that my myself and my first husband attended with our kids and that my kids and first husband are still there so that's that's pretty much it i mean you're you're out you you this judge has ruled against you your uh, ex-husband is um you know he's got the kids again so to say in a certain way um you're what else i mean you have no attorney i i didn't have an attorney i um i didn't know where to turn as a matter of fact out of desperation, I made a Facebook post about everything that had happened with the boys, um, including I put the court documents that said that stated exactly why they were put into permanent guardianship. Um, an anonymous person uh, messaged me and said, "We'll find you a lawyer. Here's who you should contact," and gave me a whole list. And they said this person said at the very end and. I doubt he'll take your case because he's really busy and he's a high profile lawyer now, but at, as a last ditch effort, call Mark, Mark Angelucci. And so I contacted all the other lawyers on the list first and every one of them turned me down. Um, and at the la as a last ditch effort, I called Mark Angelucci and um, left a message for him. And within an hour, he called me back. Um, I was floored. I knew all about the Jerry Cox case. Um, 
I knew a lot about um, what was happening with it at the time and about Mark being his lawyer. Um, I, I was talking, even just having a conversation with Mark went, meant hope for me and my kids. Um, and he was so phenomenal. Like, he just, he didn't even say a lot of words when he talked to me, but what he did say was always so uplifting and made me feel like I had a chance, you know. You and, and um, Mark started working on this case. Mm -hmm. There were several um, emails exchanged, um, documents, um, and you guys started moving forward, getting some momentum going again. Yes. Actually, it was really, really exciting. Um, um, my, I was telling you earlier, my quote of the day, when Mark um, would ask me, like, um, wait, so you don't know this person that supposedly took the test? So she never came to court? He's, he's, he's reiterating several times. So she never came to court. You have, they have no witness against you. Yes. Uh, he says, well, Walton is uh, not a by-the-book by judge. He's a I-do-what-I-want judge. Let's go to that, that day, July 11th. Um, what were you doing on that day? Hmm. I don't remember for sure. I think I was working. Um, actually, I, I, don't, I didn't find out until the next morning, I think. My son, the one I was talking to, Dylan, um, he uh, texted me a, a link to the news story. Um, the the shock and depression that I felt was this probably at the same level as when I lost my kids again. Um, I'm still in shock and I'm still really, really, really angry because so many people don't realize uh, what an impact he was making. And my case is although it's my whole world, is this big compared to what he was doing. Um, and, and, you know, so a lot of these um, anti-feminist lawyers or um, men's rights groups, whatever, they're, oh, they're so over the top and so <sighs> filled with angst. And, I mean, there's a place, of course, for that um, in any, any issue. But that's not Mark. That wasn't Mark. Mark was quietly, actually changing things. And he was so good. And he was, he's, he was like a big brother to me. Um, I'm just, I'm, I just really, really hope that all of the things he, was, he had started are not going to get lost. There you have it, uh, Jennifer Johnson. Um, wonderful interview. Uh, had a lot of great things to say about Mr. Angelucci, um, who was, uh, in fact, a great attorney um, who was all about justice. And it didn't matter if you were male or female. If the um, if the scales of justice weren't evenly balanced for you, he he would. Uh, he would look out for you. He would come to bat. He was the attorney that understood all the jargon that they use, to, you know, in the law to confuse, you know, you and I, normal Joes who are out there just working, trying to make a living, learning our own skill sets. Um, and then we have to figure out what the hell they're saying in Latin. <laughs> so anyways, Mark was an incredible lawyer, an incredible lawyer. Um, and Jennifer Johnson's case is very interesting, too, because of the guardianship uh, involved and the fact that she did take multiple hair follicle tests and was forced again and again to prove that she was a good mother. But Judge Walton immediately um, accepted the fact that her um, ex-husband um, 
w was okay to see his kids as long as the uh, grandmother um, said it was okay. So it, there Mark saw a, an injustice um, uh, from, by, you know, by this judge upon this woman. And um, if he was a mad, crazy feminist attorney, he would have um, probably just turned his head away from her and, and moved on. So obviously he wasn't what the media, corporate media paints him out to be. And rest in peace, Mark Angelucci. Uh, we're not going to let this one go. Not going to let it go. we got a lot, um, a lot of um, leads. We've got a lot of things going on. So we need to know for sure what happened. Um, and if you're an attorney out there and you're looking for a good case to grab on, you need to contact Jennifer Johnson. Uh, send me uh, an email to... Uh, E J F A network at gmail.com and um, I'll forward it over to her and um, hopefully uh, she can get her case resolved um, and get those babies back home where they belong with their mama. And uh, wow, she started a fabulous new life and she's doing really well for herself. And I'm so proud um, to have met her. And I hope that her case um, is resolved soon. And, uh, you know, again, those babies need to be home with their mama, um, ASAP. Uh, so uh, wrapping this up, um, <clears throat> I hope you guys understand that there's some really heavy um, stuff going on out there. Um, basically, your land, if it's paid for, your house, if it's paid for, and a guy like Mark Adams or another supposed receivership company in California wants to take it, they're coming for it. Um, if, if you got some dirty brown or if you got some brown grass outside, you haven't watered it, watch out. Okay. I'm dead serious. That's what's going on in California. And we, the voters aren't watching or, or paying attention to it. If you want to understand the story further, go to our website, above all You can also register there for free. Um, we have several stories on the Jerry Cox case. Uh, I just found out about the Jennifer Johnson case, but the Jerry Cox case, I was started following this from back in 2015 when I had my first news agency, the Merced County News Television. And it came across as a guy who got arrested for raping a woman he met on um, FarmersOnly.com. Um, unlike... Uh, the other news outlets, I followed up on the case because, uh, you know, it turns out the guy was actually not guilty. But all the other news outlets that reported on his case did not report that. They didn't do a follow-up report to show that, hey, you know, this, this new information came forward. This is what's going on. Uh, the Mariposa Gazette, got to give them uh, kudos. Um, they've come a long way um, in reporting local uh, information, truthful and factual information. Um, whoever's running it now, I, I'm, you know, kudos to you. You're doing a fantastic job. You know, we never, we're never perfect in this business, but, um, we do the best we can. That's the most important. If you can go to bed at night, knowing you did the best you can at providing uh, the news and information that you've, you know, chosen to do, um, and you can go to bed in a sound way yeah, that that's the best you can do. Um, no one's ever going to like us uh, completely 100%. All we can do is report the facts and that's uh, leave it up to the voter. Anyway, so um, that's going to do it for this edition of the um, IPJ, the podcast. Um, we are going to be trying to push a show out every two weeks. Uh, it's going to be a lot of uh, interesting guests coming in the show, uh, coming on the show, uh, including uh, my dear friend and uh, Broham from way back when, Mr. Brent Miller. Um, he and I have done so many productions together. In fact, we were in a film with uh, Mila Kunis. 
Um, and we're, we're going to discuss that at the, uh, during the podcast. So check into that. Now, where do you get all our podcasts? Because we got a lot of cool stuff coming up. We got. I'm talking celebrities. I'm talking about fighters. I'm talking about filmmakers. I'm talking about musicians. I, I'll get all kinds of stuff. And then also the people uh, in the political sphere. We want to talk with them as well. And then, but most importantly, honestly, uh, before I, I talk with a celebrity, before I talk with a, a, a politician, I want to talk to you. Because IPJ, the podcast, is, is for you. It's your voice. So, and that's why I'm, I started this. Um, I don't want to sit here and bore you with my crap. I, I want to hear what's going on from you. Because you know, not, not Karen Bass and not um, um, Daryl Issa or whatever, um, um, Nunez. Uh, I want to know from you what's going on. And so does the rest of California. If you have something in your life that's that's uh, causing problems, a legal issue, uh, courts, um, maybe it's me. Call uh, or actually send me an email to the e or to ejfa network at gmail.com with your phone number and a brief uh, summary of what you want to you know discuss. Even if it's to tell me off, that's fine. I will open it up for you to do that now remember we have to keep it in certain time limit because you know i bore people pretty easy so um maybe you won't but uh anyways we got to keep it in a certain time limit so is this is gonna be fun i look forward to it i'm sure there's a lot of people out there that have read my work that have done uh watched my work um that might have a few words choice words for me i can accept that it's all good you know i'm just try to keep it not too crazy um but you know just know man i I love you i love um you know doesn't matter race doesn't matter creed doesn't matter religion if you're a good human being i got love for you you know i got respect for you you screw that up Uh, i'm one of those that just you know so and that's the way the world should be you know you screw up you got to go away till you fix it and you can fix it it's never forever but you got to fix it you got to show that you're worth it and that's the same same thing with our justice system right now. Our justice system is broken from our attorneys, whom I've reported on several times from drunken idiots in court to actually meth heads in court representing Americans. Um, I've reported on them. Look at our website, abovealllaws.com. Got a lot of great stories there. Um, also, another story I want to point out that we're going to be covering will be the uh, Ronnie Cole um um, suspicious uh, death circumstances and once again guess where this is coming out of yep mariposa county california there's a lot of problems up there and i'm just thinking about frank cole and his whole family right now man i'm sending you a lot of a lot of uh, strength brother i i think about you guys often i think about your other son uh, and his circumstance i haven't forgotten about you i'm sorry it's taking me a little time to get this podcast going but we're going now uh, and we're going to have a lot of these stories coming to you. A lot of good stuff um, and hopefully some giveaways. <laughs> so we'll see. Anyways, I'm Matthew Gonzalez. I want to say thank you so much again for joining me for this first of uh, many, many to come. IPJ, the podcast. Um, it's your voice. Use it. Use it.